In this last lesson, I want to introduce the term fugacity to you, explain to you a little bit about what it is and how it's used. Now, I am not going to go through a full rigorous derivation at this stage in this course. So our goals here will be to define what fugacity is for a pure substance and then show different ways that we can calculate the fugacity and the fugacity coefficient, which is simply a dimensionless version of fugacity. And we'll do this for pure substances using cubic equations of state, virial equations of state, and generalized correlations. And then see how fugacity is used to define phase equilibrium in a pure species. Now the advantage of this is that whereas we have ways of calculating phase equilibrium in species, this is going to be generalized to mixtures, which is handy. And also it can be used to predict the phase equilibrium when you don't have a full set of data. Maybe it's a newly discovered species or newly created species, or maybe it's just something, some, simply something that wasn't well studied before because it had no real practical use and now you need information. So that's what we'll be talking about in this this is just a simple introduction to the topic. It's a fairly massive topic for thermodynamics too. So we're just introducing the concept here. So in lesson 10 we talked about the phase equilibrium criteria. And what we basically said is that phases are in equilibrium when the change in the Gibbs energy is equal to zero. Okay, So that means that the Gibbs energy in those two phases, the alpha and beta phase, will be equal to each other. And this can be for the total Gibbs energy or a specific Gibbs energy. One of the things that people do frequently is they define a chemical potential. And it's how Gibbs energy changes if you change the number of moles of a particular species while you're holding temperature and pressure constant. So if you just change the amount of something... Now, for a pure substance, this is sort of not very interesting. But when you're talking about it in a mixture, so you have 50 moles of A and 50 moles of B, and now then you add one more molecule of A. How do the other chemicals around it react? That's what the chemical potential is describing. Okay? Now, if you use this, since really we're just taking derivatives of G, and if the change in G is zero, then the derivatives of G have to also be zero, or the sum is zero. And so therefore we get that the chemical potentials in the two phases have to be zero. This is really useful, and it sounds real practical, and when you take chemistry classes, a lot of times they'll talk about the chemical potential as being the way that we describe phase equilibrium. Unfortunately, the reality is that the math becomes very challenging. So people play a little math game. They do a transform. Now a transform is something where you take like a straight line, and we've done this like by taking a logarithmic axis uh, for maybe the y variable on a y equals e to the x kind of function. And we take something that's maybe a curve and we stretch it into a straight line. That's a form of a math transform. Math transforms might involve derivatives, integrals, any mathematical operation that you can consistently do to the original function. So in this particular case, there is a useful transformation that looks complicated, but it turns out that it makes the math easier. And so fugacity is generally defined in terms of the chemical potential of a species. Now, there's not a starting point, a zero state, so we define a reference state. So how chemical potential changes from its reference state is defined to be R, the gas constant, times the temperature, and that needs to be absolute, times the natural log of the fugacity of the substance. When, when it has a hat on it, it means it's in a mixture, divided by what it is at that reference state. Now, for a pure substance, this nonsense with the hats makes no difference, and mu is the same as specific Gibbs energy. So I can say this, which is a little bit easier to work with as a starting point. 
Now again, that little reference state here is simply whatever you have defined to be. This is the zero of the point. There's not a real official place. Now, the guy who invented this, his name was uh, Dr. Lewis, G.N. Lewis, he decreed that what happens is when the pressure goes to zero, every gas behaves ideally, and so therefore the fugacity of the substance compared to its reference fugacity as the pressure goes to zero will always be one. Okay, So that gives us one kind of fixed value that we can use. Now, some of the things, because really the key thing here is just that you accept that the word fugacity is not scary and that you have some sense of what it means. Okay. Now, first of all, fugacity, the word, it's a weird sounding word, but it's the same root word as fugitive. Okay, so we've seen, you know, crime shows or watched on the news and we have a fugitive on the loose. Okay, so that's a prisoner that has fled the scene, right? So in this case, it's a chemical that wants to flee the phase, okay? So that's what a fugacity is trying to measure, is a tendency for a chemical to leave and move to the other phase. The units of this, because of the way it's defined, turn out to be pressure. So if we want a dimension-free form, we use a fugacity coefficient, which is the fugacity divided by the pressure of the system. And that gives us something that is going to be no dimensions, means that we can do a lot of things with it, tabulate stuff, and not worry about, oh, well, you want it to be in the SI system? I'm sorry, we were doing this in you know, some other system. So now, if I accept this, then what this tells me is that my equilibria criteria are Thermal equilibrium means that the temperatures of the two phases are the same. Mechanical equilibrium means that the pressures in the two phases are the same. And chemical equilibrium means, well, it could mean that Gibbs energies are the same, but it also can mean that the fugacities are the same in the two phases. And mathematically, this last form is the most useful. So usually what we do is we choose the reference state so that the temperature is the same as the system temperature and the pressure is whatever it takes to be low enough so that it acts like an ideal gas. So P is maybe approaching zero, but for a lot of substances that might be atmospheric pressure. So if it's an ideal gas, then the F1 at the reference state is going to be P naught, that reference pressure where it behaves like an ideal gas. Now if we do that and we say that we have constant temperature and I wanted to look at what delta G is, well DG is VDP because the you know SDT part is well zero because it's constant temperature. And so therefore all I have to do is integrate the change in G is going to be the integral of VDP. And we've defined this to be equal to this, so therefore this gives me a way to evaluate what F is by simply completing this integral. Now if I have an equation of state, no problem, I can do that. In our book we have several different forms of the integrals, and I skipped ahead a couple of slides. Um, but if you do that, then they have things like for the cubic equations of state, they have all those forms with A's and B's. Remember those? Well, they have that sort of thing for fugacities also. And so if you're using the Peng Robinson equation of state, this is the form that comes out of doing this integral. There are a lot of others of these in the textbook. No need to burden ourselves with all those forms. But they are just the result of doing this integration. We also can do this using corresponding states. Lee Kessler have tabulated these just like they did for the residual properties. And so the way they did this, now they wanted everything to be dimension free, so they did phi, the fugacity coefficient, that's F over the system pressure. But the log, and this is log base 10, log of phi is equal to log phi naught plus um, the acentric factor omega times log phi 1, that correction. So if you want to use that then 
the fugacity is the pressure times 10 to the this mess. Okay, but log not and log V1 are things that I can look up. So I can look them up in tables in the back of the book, or here is a graph of what these things look like. And it's very much like doing the problems with corresponding states before. I need the eccentric factor, I need the reduced temperature and pressure, and then I can follow that up to figure out what the fugacity is for the gas. Now for a liquid, that's not really going to work quite so well. So for a liquid, what I have to do is, well, I need to first of all start by noting that at the saturation pressure, I have two phases. And if I have two phases, those phases have equal fugacities. So the fugacity of the vapor and the fugacity of the liquid will both be the same and they will be the saturation fugacity at that particular point. Now I have a way of estimating the vapor fugacity. Just did that in the previous slide. So if I want to be able to figure out what it is for the liquid, then I need to take that liquid and, well, do the integral thing again. So the VDP, okay, the over RT is to fix all my units, bringing all those things in from my F. If you go back and look at the slide, it's you can follow where that comes in. But I end up with this. So I have V for the liquid is the vapor fugacity times a pressure correction. This pressure correction is called the pointing pressure correction. I evaluate these at the given temperature and I go from the vapor pressure to the actual pressure to figure out what the fugacity is of the liquid at this phase. Solids, okay, well, I have a saturation point for solids also, right, at the triple point or along the um, solid liquid equilibrium curve or the solid vapor equilibrium curve. At low pressures, I can just estimate the fugacity saying, oh, it's going to be about the same as the pressure. At higher pressures, I'm going to need to, again, approximate that integral of the VDP over RT. V for solids just hardly changes at all. So I can simply say it's V times delta P over RT. And this is a way that I can calculate for solids. So I can use this to calculate fugacities for solids, liquids, or vapors. I just need to know the proper way to correct from the, say, one fixed point of the vapor pressure or phase equilibrium that maybe I did know, one fixed point. The way that this is going to eventually be used is to calculate phase equilibrium. Okay, So what you have to do, the, it's a complicated procedure, but so you want to figure out where two phases will coexist. Okay, So you're wanting to find the vapor pressure. Okay, You want to find the Z for the liquid and the vapor, and all of this means you really need to find the fugacity of the liquid and the vapor. And you're wanting to do all this so that the fugacity of the liquid phase and the vapor phase are equal to each other. So the way the process works is that you guess at the vapor pressure, use that to figure out what you think the fugacities of the liquid and vapor should be, see if they're equal to each other. Well, since you just probably guessed at the vapor pressure, they're probably not equal. So you make a correction. And that correction, you use the first guess of the vapor pressure, multiply by the liquid fugacity, divide by the vapor fugacity, and that gets you a new guess at the pressure. And this usually only takes a few iterations before it converges reasonably well. Now, each of these steps is fairly time consuming. Computers do this very well. They don't mind the time consuming part as long as you have a method that converges, and this method will converge. And so this becomes a very useful way of predicting phase equilibrium or checking for phase equilibrium when we have limited data. So that concludes our lesson 14.